Does that feel a bit cramped there? Um, some of these searching for truth questions that Harry and I have been working through in this series can be answered quite quickly. Others are taking a little bit more uh, time to be able to uh, provide some clarity in order, for it to be, in order for us to be able to get to the bottom of the question. And today, I think, is one of those. Even though, on the surface, it can seem quite cut and dry. The question is whether Sunday church is a waste of time. And in order to be able to deal with this question, I think we've got to go right back to the start to ask a very basic question. What is the church? I know we're familiar with a statement that we hear frequently from different people. I don't have to attend church to be a Christian. And in essence, it's true. You don't. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a shoe shop makes you a sandal. And actually, much of the confusion about Christianity and what a Christian is, is actually caused because of this fallacy that if you go to church, you are a Christian. And then there's the other familiar question that we get uh, posed at time or positioned at a time. I can worship God from home on a Sunday. I don't need to go to church for that. And that's also true. You can worship God in your own house and you can do it on a Sunday. In fact, we all did. We all did. For 70 weeks during 2020 and 2021, we all worshipped God in our own houses separately. Oh, and we text in between and I get all that, but <coughs> excuse me, but we all did it separately. We watched our own screens and we didn't go to church for 70 weeks. Christmas, I wore a Nottingham Forest top to preach in, if you remember, if you were here on Christmas Day. When I look back, or we look back on, on some of the people who would have been here 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they would have frowned at me wearing a football top to preach in. They would have also frowned as not been in church for 70 weeks. But we weren't. But we continued to worship, did we? Outside of church. For years, you'd be able to watch songs of praise on TV or listen to the Sunday service on various radio stations. And now there are online churches, various numbers of them of one type or another, where you can consume church in the comfort of your own homes at the time of your choosing, making it so much easier for you. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with having church online services. Not at all. I'm actually all for it. We do it here, and it's a great resource. But if we can consume church in this way, if we can just listen to a message, if we can sing along with some of the songs, if we can say amen after some of the prayers that are said, if we can conveniently do church at home, doesn't that actually make Sunday church a waste of time? In this seemingly enlightened world that we now live in, is there actually a need to have Sunday church in person anymore anyway, if I can consume church at home? Well, just to pin my colors to the mast at this point, because I can see some of you getting rather concerned at where this is is, uh, is going, I believe there is. I believe that Sunday church is invaluable and is absolutely necessary to living the most effective Christian life. And I think that online services are ideal for those people who are unable to attend uh, or have no alternative. 
or who want to listen again, or who want to top up what they've already had, but not as an excuse not to come and gather together. So essential is gathering together that the writer of Hebrews tells us not to forsake it. He doesn't go to the trouble of telling us why not. He just says we shouldn't. Nevertheless, I think we must understand why we should try to ensure that we are in church if we possibly can and refresh ourselves again with the, what the purpose of church actually is. See, it's too easy to do the stuff because we've already always done the stuff. Too easy for us to believe stuff because we've always believed it that way. And the beauty, I think, of this series that we're going through is that we're able to go back over some of the ground that we might not have covered for decades and ask again these types of questions to refresh ourselves as to why actually these are important for us to be involved in. Now, not that I remember it, but after being born, and after leaving Menegates Hospital, we made, apparently, a detour on the way home. And before I got home, the first place that mom wanted to take me, and I guess dad as well, but she was the loudest, so she got the, she got the say. The first place that she said, and she was insistent that I went first, was to church. And so before going home, we stopped off at the Methodist Church in Creelston, where I, mum, I assume, gave thanks for the safe delivery of her precious, darling, firstborn. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And from that time onwards, my life included time in church. Whether it was at the Methodist church with where mum went or the Anglican church where dad went, we were always doing something in or around church. A church building, a church event of which there were plenty. And even when we were on holidays, we got taken around as kids, cathedrals or churches. Uh, just to have a look. I mean, well, as a nine-year-old, I recall being on holiday with my sister, who she'd be seven or so at the time, and we went to Wells Cathedral. I mean, you know, a nine-year-old of all the places to go to, to, to Wells Cathedral, but it would turn into a disaster for us. It was a disaster. Because as we were going into Wells Cathedral, uh, mom and dad got told that, uh, oh, it's great that you're here. We are about to start a choir recital. Uh, please take your seats. And so we ended up sitting through what was positively awful. An hour as a nine-year-old, which seemed like days that we would never get back. People singing such high-pitched in a foreign language you couldn't make out. Such a waste of time for me as a nine-year-old. It scarred my holiday, ruined it. Still makes me shudder when I look on the map and see wells down there. And in fact, I have to say, it was close. But if we'd have called this the Wells Church, I probably wouldn't have been here now. I'd have, I'd have gone. It was just like we're definitely not adding an S to the, to the end of that. But for me, growing up was all about church. And church was all about the building. It was about the fabric. It was about the bricks. It was about the nuts and bolts of the building. We went to church. We decorated church. We cleaned church. We tidied church. Church was a place for us to go to. And growing up on a Sunday morning, it was fixed. It was where we went. Sunday was church day. We went to church. And as I read through the Old Testament, I can understand this type of view. Originally, Abraham is called out of that awful place. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> He's got out of this awful place got rid of the Chaldees. And, and he has this, this purpose of becoming a, a group of people set apart from the world and having this, this unique relationship with God, a, a, unique, a unique, unique role within the nations. He was called to come from one place to go to another place. And over time, that place of worship of God for the Israelites was about a building. Whether it was the the tabernacle at the beginning or or the temple later, it was about a place. Even the altars that were built were built as reminders of a place where God was active in the past. The temple, when it was built by Solomon, was where the presence of God resided. And so the people came to that temple and they came to worship in the temple. And in fact, there was an expectation that you had to go to the temple in Jerusalem. If you recall the circumstances around the northern tribes not coming to worship and sacrifice in the temple is is attributed to what's referred to as the, uh, the, the sins of Jeroboam. It was expected of the people that they were to go. There was religious activity around the temple. It carried a sense of identity for the people. And most importantly, sacrifices that were necessary were carried out in the temple. And as we saw when we took our journey through Ezra, when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, it took away the people's identity. Their spiritual identity was gone because he was all about the building. So much so that when the Jews were, were exiled in that foreign land in Babylon, they had no central place for worship. They compensated for this by gatherings together and they called them synagogues. These were places where Jewish community could could come together for for prayer and for study and for reading the Torah. And after the exile, when they all came back into land, even though the temple had been rebuilt, (coughs) synagogues for local gatherings became increasingly widespread. And by the time of Jesus, they had become a significant institution within Jewish life. Jesus himself would often go to teach in the synagogues. Worship would happen there. Why? Because it was about a building for the Jews, primarily for the temple, but also for the synagogues. And it wasn't just the Jews, the Samaritans, the the kind of the people that came out of the northern kingdom of, uh, of Israel, the Samaritans, they worshiped on the mountain. John 4, when Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, she says, it's on this mountain. They wanted to be closer to God. It was about a place. See, in the past, the presence of God was understood to reside in a building. But after the resurrection, when Jesus breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit, and they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the believers themselves became the carriers of, of the Holy Spirit, and therefore they became the temples of the Holy Spirit. And these believers, these these carriers of the Holy Spirit, they began to call themselves the church. And this church is not a building like it was for the Jews. It's not what we see on on the side of the road or on a map. That's just a place where the church meets, not the church. The church is different from the temple or from the synagogue because Jesus has made the difference by giving us the Holy Spirit to make us the carriers of God's presence rather than the visitors to it. Of course, it was Jesus who coined the the phrase church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But what does Jesus mean when he said about the word church? Well, the word in Greek for church is actually two words. The word ecclesia. Ek meaning out or out from. 
and klesis, which is the verb kalio, meaning to call. And so ecclesia can be understood as those who are called out or called out once. But to understand the depth of this word, we have to view it from the time when the word ecclesia was first used. And it was before Christians. Ecclesia was a term used in Greek cities and referred to an assembly of chosen citizens who were called out of their communities to participate and to make decisions of public matters, type of council or government. And the adoption of this word ecclesia helped many Christians to be able to articulate a sense of identity as a community who had been called and chosen and driven out by God, not for civic governance, but on a spiritual mission, a unique way of life. It, for, them, for them, it created a sense of unity, of purpose, an engagement that transcended geog geographic, demographic, and cultural boundaries. It echoes the language for us of uh, the, the Jews and the Israelites have been called out and chosen that Abraham and Israel in the Old Testament. And it underscores the early church understanding of themselves as a people specifically chosen and called by God. Called out of darkness, called out of sin, called out of the world and separated from sin and worldly practices. Called out to live holy and righteous lives in accordance with God's will. See, the church is the collective of Christians. We are the church. When we meet together, we are church gathered together. You can't do church on your own because it's Plural Christians that makes the church, not just an individual. And when I look at the, the early church in Acts, I see the people meeting together. They worshipped together. They prayed together. They learned together. They figured things out together. They broke bread together. I see the church functioning together in the spiritual gifts, reaching out together. And perhaps even more importantly, I see them fellowshipping together. For the church offers something together that a life of isolation is not possible to have. Christians are not meant to be isolated. And we know that because the mark of the church is not that the church will worship because we can worship on our own. It's not that the church will pray because we can pray on our own. It's not that the church can learn or teach because we can learn and teach on our own. The mark of the church is that they will love one another is that they will serve one another. That they will encourage one another. Bear with one another. Accept one another. Strengthen one another. Honor one another. Admonish one another. Show hospitality to one another. Pray for one another. Live in harmony with one another, spur one another on to good works and love, forgive one another, carry one another's burdens, care for one another, be patient with one another. You cannot do those things without first fellowshipping and being with one another. See, the phrase one another that appears so frequently throughout the New Testament is a reciprocal 
pronoun, and it's used to convey a mutual action or relationship between two or more subjects involved. The, the Greek for one another is plural. So it is always referring to more than one person. And in all but a handful of cases, one another's are written in the imperative mood, which makes them commands. This is the type of behavior that Jesus expects to see within his church. And Paul refers to this nature of collective Christians as a church body. In 1 Corinthians 12, and working through uh, some of the verses, for even as the body is one, and yet as many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of this body. It is not for this reason, any the less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If there were all one member, then where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And that is quite profound. When we become Christians, we are not to be isolated individuals, but rather we collectively form a body to function in a certain way as to benefit one another. That formation of the body has been put together. It's been composed by God himself so that we can support each other in ways that we could not do alone. And perhaps the best way of understanding this for our own function better is to consider a grand, beautifully crafted orchestra. Each instrument within this orchestra represents a member of the church, from the graceful violins, like Selena, the booming drums, <coughs> Bob, From the triumphant trumpets through to the soothing flutes. Every, every single instrument has a unique sound, a specific role, and a distinct contribution. When the orchestra is in full harmony, when each musician is playing their part with skill and passion, the result is a symphony of beauty that can move hearts 
and uplift souls. The music resonates in a way that no single instrument could achieve on its own. But what happens if the musician decides not to play or goes out of tune? What if the drummer loses the rhythm or the flutist doesn't follow the conductor's lead? Then the whole orchestra suffers. The music becomes discordant. The beauty of the symphony is lost. Just like this orchestra, our church, this, this collective, of believers. It's composed of many members, each with a distinct role, with a special gift, with a unique contribution. We are not merely to be passive spectators, but active participants, each playing in harmony with each other. We are not solo performance. We are part of God's grand orchestra. Our responsibility to each other is to play our part, to stay in tune, and to follow his lead. Our actions, our behavior, we have to recognize can either have a positive or a negative consequence on the whole of the body. And the whole body, we each have a responsibility to play our part for each other. And I think, I think Sunday church is the catalyst for that. I think being in church on a Sunday and being together creates an environment where fellowshipping can flourish from which and through which the behavior of church flows. Yes, there is worship here. Yes, there is teaching. Yes, there is breaking of bread. But those things, to a degree, we can do on our own. But fellowship and togetherness happens when we are together. When we join together. When we gather together. And from that togetherness comes the orchestra that plays the symphony of God which is what makes church one of the most incredible things that there is. See, there is nothing, I don't think, in all the world quite like church. A place of belonging that cuts through age and culture and status and background. A place where whoever we are, we can all fit in and play our part. And I think that the Ecclesia, when operating correctly, draws more to its orchestra because Sunday church is compelling when the outworking symphony of praise is played in the way that it has been called to be. Sunday church is not a waste of time. It's not a time when we fulfill a long-held obligation. It is a time to be cherished, to uphold, to look forward to, and to protect. It's a time when we should be eager to play our parts and through the lens of which we see effective Christian service. Sunday church is a gift. 
that we get to enjoy every week gathered amongst the collective of believers with which we share the privilege of being called Ecclesia. Let's pray. God, we thank you that not only did you not leave us on our own, but that you have grafted us into your body, the church. And not just a church collectively around the world, but a community here. And God, as I look around and as I consider our church here, God, I pray your blessing in mighty measures upon it. That the unity that we have, God, you would not just protect, but you would even further develop. That you would increase a sense of fellowship and togetherness, a bond that cannot be broken. That we would each be encouraged even more to play our parts in your symphony of praise. That through this place, this ecclesia of gathered believers, you would draw even more to yourself that the praise of your name from this orchestra would resound all the louder, more beautifully, and be a fragrance to your ears. In your name we would ask. Amen.